My name is John Graydon. I have the privilege of being the founder and executive director of the University of Michigan Depression Center. And tonight, it's my privilege to actually just introduce our speaker. Um, Cheryl King, Dr. Cheryl King is a professor in the departments of psychiatry and psychology and director of the Mary Rackham Institute at the University of Michigan. She's director of the Youth Depression and Suicide Research Program in the Department of Psychiatry. And Cheryl is someone who I had the privilege of introducing this morning as well for a different conference. Uh, and I said many nice things, and they all were justified. She has developed and provided programs that have led numerous initiatives, multiple federally funded research programs focused on developing evidence-based strategies for adolescent and young adult suicide risk screening, and you'll hear some of those. She currently serves as the principal investigator of three NIMH-funded research projects. Many people would be happy to ever have one in their career. She has three just at this moment and they consist of an emergency department screen for teens at risk for suicide. Uh, this is designed to actually develop a term that you'll hear, a brief adaptive suicide risk screen that can be disseminated nationwide. And then a second one is an electronic bridge to mental health for college students, and She'll explain that. And the third one is a 24-hour risk for suicide attempts in a national cohort of adolescents. Cheryl is the recipient of the League of Research Excellence Award from the University of Michigan Medical School. That's a big deal. She's a clinical educator, a mentor in our world at the university. She has trained and educated an entire generation and she serves as the, served as the department's first director of psychology training. She provided leadership for the postdoctoral training program in psychology, helped achieve, achieve its status as one of the first five programs in the nation to achieve national accreditation. She has twice been selected by the recipients of educational teaching as the teacher of the year. Award, and she currently provides research mentorship to students. She's an author of a book, um, Teen Suicide Risk, A Practitioner Guide to Screening Assessment and Management. And I could go on and on. This morning I said I had the privilege of recruiting Cheryl, but uh, in addition to her testifying to Congress and doing everything else, she's also the past president of the American Association of Suicidology. The only comment that I will make is that at this stage in time, because those of us in this part of this network, this community, we have done some struggling, as all of you know. That's why you're here. And I think that struggling is with things that uh, we don't like and we're not used to seeing. And so to try to address these some time ago, I actually suggested that we turn tonight's event into a focus on this topic. We are privileged and blessed to have support for an annual event that is now in its 15th year. That is basically the Tatawita. Uh, scholar program, emerging scholar program, and Todd was a young man who was a former University of Michigan student who had his troubles during adolescent, got help, had a supportive family after having to leave school for a while, went back, flourished, thrived, graduated, went here, became a maize and blue addict and was working for the Cantor Fitzgerald operation in September 11th, 2001, and died in the World Trade Center incident. His parents, uh, Herb and Andrea Oida, gave some support to the University of Michigan Depression Center to do things, and tonight we've decided to start the first of these community things. But before I hand this mic, or her own mic, to Dr. King, I would like all of us to acknowledge Herb and Andrea Oida, who are in this auditorium with us. Thank you. 
And now there will be a panel afterwards, but it's now my privilege to uh, let Dr. Cheryl King give a presentation on this difficult but vitally important topic. Cheryl. So um, thank you for that um, generous introduction. I was listening though and it, it just sounded like I've been around for such a long time. Um, but I appreciate each and every one of you coming out this evening. Uh, we do have a really important topic and each of us have a, have a part to, to play as we move forward and try to reduce um, the youth suicide rate in our nation and prevent uh, each uh, youth suicide. If we, I'm gonna be putting my finger up or what is helpful um, is so that the slides can move forward. So to begin, I think it will be helpful and I invite you to consider the lives of uh, teens with me, of four teens. And these may be teens uh, in our community. They may live next door to you, around the corner from you. One of them may be in your home. And these teens have a lot in common. Um, they're all living in a home with at least one parent. Someone cares very deeply for each of them. Often, many more than one person cares very deeply for them. They all have cell phones. They're all attending high school. But they also, some of them are struggling more than others on the inside. Some of them have more suicide risk factors than others, just like they differ, differ in every other way. Any health conditions they have, their academic strengths, how extroverted or introverted they are, what they like to do in their free time. They also vary in their level of mental health and their suicide risk. One thing we do know is that despite many people uh, working on this for a long time, the youth suicide rate is, is going up in our country. And it's gone up about 25% since the turn of the century. And you can see the rate is obviously higher for older teens than younger teens. But this shows us where we've been from 2000 to 2015. So we have, we have more work to do. When we try to understand, because part of moving forward is understanding what places these teens at risk, one thing that's important is to always keep in mind that uh, many different factors go into youth suicide risk. There are not linear, straight relationships between any one factor and being suicidal. It's usually more complicated than that. It could be a combination of depression and substance use. It could be bipolar and problems with peers and connections. It could be many different factors coming together and exacerbating each other at a particular point in time. So it may not always be a clinical depression. In some instances, it might be someone who really cannot manage negative emotions when they do have them. And they have a, a big upset or catastrophe or trauma in their life. They can't manage the negative emotion and they engage in alcohol or drug use and then they lose their ability to manage the emotions at all or to consider options and problem solve. So we have many different pathways to suicide risk and we're gonna just look briefly, not in an exhaustive way, at what some of these risk factors are. So one is um, reporting to us or sharing or having suicidal thoughts or making a suicide attempt. And this just gives you an idea of why it can be so challenging to prevent suicide because it's a fair number of youth, of students in our schools who do report suicidal thoughts and make suicide attempts. As you can see, the uh, more turquoise uh, bars are the girls. They're about twice as likely to say that they've seriously considered suicide, that they've made a suicide plan, 
and they are twice as likely to make a suicide attempt. However, suicide deaths are more common among teenage boys and among men than among women. So about 80% of suicides are male suicides. So it's hard to identify risk in the males because they're less likely to share suicidal thoughts and make a suicide attempt. On the other side of it, we have many teens who do share and report suicidal thoughts, many, many, many more than are likely at risk for suicide. So our first risk factors are a history of suicidal behavior or attempt. As in most things in life, the best predictor of our future behavior is our past behavior in a similar situation. Youth who have had extreme difficulties in coping and have made a suicide attempt are more likely than other youth to make a suicide attempt again. We also know now from more recent research that youth who engage in non-suicidal self-injury, this is often in the form of cutting, uh, are at elevated risk to go on and make a suicide attempt, are, as are youth who share suicidal thoughts. Uh, mental illness, uh, mental disorder, psychopathology is almost always present when we have uh, suicide. And this takes the form, many different forms. It's often a depressive or affective illness, depression, bipolar disorder, alcohol, substance use, but also among adolescents and young adults, uh, aggressive patterns of behavior and conduct problems are a risk factor that is often present with a suicide. None of these need to be present, um, and not all of them need to be present. So we have different combinations in different youth. Some of the other considerations, just to name some, one is sleep disturbance. Uh, across the lifespan, we're learning more and more about sleep, the importance of it to our mental health. Sleep disturbance in teens is a consideration that we want to check in on and try to help with to the extent that we can. Impulsivity. Many people refer to teen suicide attempts as impulsive. This has been a little bit harder to get a handle on, but it looks like most of the time they are not impulsive. Um, the majority of youth who make attempts when asked after the fact, they will say that they had thought of it before. I think where uh, some of this is how we look at, whether it's impulsive or not, sometimes a youth has had suicidal thoughts intermittently um, when they're most upset or when they're in a particularly down period, then they go out with friends and they seem fine. Or they sit down for a family meal and they seem fine. Um, maybe for several days in a row. So the thoughts have sometimes been there all along, but they have been intermittent. And then when there is an interpersonal crisis or they're under the influence and struggling with depression, those thoughts become activated and we have a suicide attempt. Hopelessness is probably as good or better a predictor as sharing suicidal thoughts, severe hopelessness. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, uh, sexual minority youth and gender minority youth. We have plenty of studies now to show these youth are more likely to report suicidal thoughts, more likely to attempt suicide, they have higher levels. It's not their sexual orientation or gender identity per se. They have higher levels of more distal and more proximal risk factors. Child maltreatment and peer bullying and victimization. Again, because these are risk factors for some, they are not always present. Uh, but a history of child maltreatment particularly in the form of sexual abuse, is heightened risk for suicide, and bullying and victimization. And here it is both those who engage in the bully, bullying and those who are victims, and the ones who are both bullies and victims actually have the most elevated risk. 
those youth are probably quite isolated from others and uh, doing very poorly emotionally and in other ways to be a bully and a victim. So what can we do and what can each of us do? We don't want to just uh, share information and uh, not impact the rate. How could we dial this down and actually meaningfully impact in a downward direction the youth suicide rate? So I'm gonna talk about some things we might do and then close with some resources for parents and teachers and others. One is we need to recognize and identify the risk when it is present. This is easier said than done. We have a couple of ways to go about doing this. One is gatekeeper training. I know there's some peer-to-peer -peer in other efforts in the school here. Gatekeepers are those who are around youth and who could recognize risk in the youth and intervene, get them to help. So gatekeepers are teachers and parents. They might be people who work in a juvenile detention center. They might be primary care providers, pediatricians. But if we can train these gatekeepers to recognize signs of risk, then we also train them what to do when they recognize it, what to say, how they might get help for the youth. That's one way we can recognize risk. The other way is a more proactive approach. It's to actually screen young people for risk. And there is a large national effort going on now to figure out how we could do this in emergency departments. Many youth move through emergency departments each year. Most youth will move through them once every few years at least. And these are general medical emergency departments where there's often wait times and an opportunity to screen for risk for injury and other kinds of concerns. Uh, proactive screening is sometimes needed, just like gatekeeper recognition, because many young people don't walk through on their own our doors seeking help. And in fact, the males who die by suicide much more often than the females are less likely to walk through our doors and seek help. Uh, okay. So how, how do we do this proactively? E everyone who has raised a teen um, or knows a teen well is familiar with this phenomena. Much is not shared. Um, like what is going on, not just in this room, but how can we really know what the distress is or the thinking is of our teen uh, if they don't choose to share it. And everyone here has been a teen once and you know all the reasons we don't choose to share some of our thoughts with our parents or with others. So what do we do with that? One thing that is very important is that we don't use suicidal thoughts as a gateway question to asking more to find out about level of risk. Um, and I think this sometimes happens with mental health professionals, but it may happen with others too. There's been a lot of training over recent years. Ask the question. Don't be afraid to ask the question. Say, I'm wondering if you've had thoughts of death and dying. I wonder if you've thought about killing yourself. I can understand, given everything that you've been going through, all that's happening, or I know working with teens, many times when this is going on at home and someone's this severely depressed, they have thoughts of killing themselves. I'm wondering if you've had thoughts like that. We don't wanna stop asking those questions, but there are young people who are acutely suicidal who will say no to those questions. Now, why do they say no? We don't know in the individual instance. For some of them, they may be ashamed of their level of distress and think they're gonna be able to manage it on their own. Um, for others, at the moment we ask them, or that day, it might be one of those intermittent periods when they're actually feeling very good. 
things are going well. They just um, hung out with friends or went skateboarding. And at this, these moments, they're doing fine, and so they don't acknowledge it. But we do know we need to get beyond suicidal thoughts. And what's really important to be on the lookout for is really severe pain, emotional pain, signs of severe distress and agitation, um, hopelessness. So the risk factors, and there are many, and I mentioned the primary ones, these become our targets where we could do something about it. First, in terms of earlier prevention, um, bullying doesn't cause suicide, sexual abuse doesn't cause it, but these are now very well-documented risk factors. So as a community, we need to do what we can to reduce these. There are bullying prevention programs that have shown some effectiveness for schools, um, a little bit more effective, with the younger ages than the older ages, but that's a place to start. Initiatives to prevent and reduce drinking and drug use, initiatives to help parents with young children with parenting skills and support. And then early intervention. Can we recognize depression early? Can we intervene after a trauma to prevent an exacerbation of the fallout from that trauma for the young person? Can we intervene early um, with alcohol and substance use if we didn't prevent it altogether? Social skills, tools for the young person who's being victimized about how they can respond to the bully perpetrators. And then treatment. Um, we do have some emerging treatments that are showing effectiveness in addition to treating the primary mental illness or psychopathology. Certainly we need to treat bipolar disorder. We need to treat depression. We need to intervene with alcohol and substance use disorders. But what we've learned with suicide risk is that we also need to target that very specifically. And one thing is that when we are beginning work with a suicidal young person, we need to validate their emotional pain and it can't be all about what's your risk today and how can I keep you safe and control you. That part's important, but the primary message really needs to be, I want to get you the help you need or work with you to resolve this pain and to stay with that until we can resolve that pain. We need to address their suicidal thoughts and hopelessness directly. Uh, there are psychotherapies that help with managing negative emotions, with seeing more options. Uh, young people don't have as much life experience. It can seem like it will never change. Um, helping them understand more options and what will change when they leave high school and the different opportunities ahead of them. Safety planning. We work a lot on safety planning when someone's at high risk. Very specifically, how are they going to manage it the next time they're that upset or feeling like cutting themselves or thinking they're going to do something toward killing themselves? How can they manage that? And we go through a series of steps and let them help us outline what steps they would take and who they might call for support. And then treat the mental illness and work toward connectedness. So some resources uh, for all of us, um, and we'll walk through some of these, and I'm sure we can find a way to uh, make these available to you afterwards, too. First, I think it's to know the youth suicide warning signs, and this website is a good place to go. Uh, a group of us in the nation uh, basically huddled with all the data available to date. Uh, and I almost feel like we weren't let out of the room until we agreed and reached a consensus on a short list of warning signs, because everything that had been put out before was very long uh, and very difficult for the public and very difficult for practitioners, too. And this was a, a unanimous consensus. Um, so a youth is talking about, they're expressing suicidal thoughts making plans or preparation, 
They're expressing hopelessness about the future. They're showing just severe, overwhelming emotional pain or distress. And they're showing worrisome behavioral signs. Now, that's not real specific because it has to work for the heterogeneity of suicide risk. But as a parent, and many of you are parents, or as a teacher, we know what a worrisome sign is. And it's often a change. Something has changed. They don't want to spend time with this friend anymore. They're asking to drop off of this team. They no longer like playing the clarinet. They've loved this. Um, something has changed, or they're showing more agitation, or they have become extremely angry when they didn't used to be. That's a worrisome sign. And then we would look, are more than one of these present? They may not all be, but when you start to see that two, three of these are present, then we would want to be sure we go get help, get an evaluation. And certainly if it's the first one, we would do that immediately. Okay. Crisis hotline help. We have, and it is um, with the benefit of federal funds and our taxpayer dollars, a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's free, it's confidential, it's 24 hours a day. There's also a marvelous, uh, at least it's a website that I use in my work with teens. I interface with suicidal teens all the time in, in the work that I do. And yourlifeyourvoice.org um, is a website that uh, we give out regularly. And at this site, you can text, chat, call, email with a well-trained crisis counselor. Okay. The Suicide Prevention Resource Center. This is a national resource. I have the website there. It's just sprc.org for Suicide Prevention Resource Center. They have an amazing number of resources from warning signs to what to do after a death and how to um, manage some of, in a school, how do you manage a crisis, in a family, what happens with bereavement, if you're a survivor, oh, lots of information, lots of good educational resources. Okay. How to talk with youth who may be suicidal. Uh, you know, the simple words are to, to share, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about you. I'm, I'm worried or I'm concerned. I'm, I'm seeing this. I'm wondering how you're doing. I'm wondering if. But there's also a lot of help to make this easier. It's not that easy to talk about suicide uh, with a young person, with anyone. And there are trainings that are available. Some of these are now being offered in the state of Michigan. Michigan has one of the uh, grants uh, to fund efforts into communities across our state to do more training. Um, older teens are welcome to these. They vary from a half day in length to a couple days in length, but it's something that uh, you could reach out and check online uh, to see when such trainings might be coming up. So at the, um, at the end of the day, I think the main um, piece of this is that all of us are here tonight for one reason, because we want to learn more, we want to understand youth suicide, and we want to learn more about what can we do uh, to try to prevent suicide so that all of our teens uh, can live their uh, full lives. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank Dr. King um, and invite our panelists to come up and answer questions. Um, we have uh, some colleagues here from the Depression Center who will be collecting those cards that you have. So I invite you to write your questions on the cards and just sort of hold them up um, and they will collect them and bring them up to me. Um, just to quickly let you know who I am, I, my name is Stephanie Salazar and I'm Outreach and Education Program Manager at the Depression Center. So uh, I am involved in all of the community outreach events. Um, and 
Once we get settled here, I would like our panelists to please quickly introduce themselves and talk just briefly about uh, their work um, in working with uh, youth at risk. So I think we already know about Dr. King, so I'll invite uh, Polly Gibson to begin. Good evening. My name is Polly Gibson. I'm a faculty member. I'm a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I direct our trauma and grief clinic, and I'm also a member of, of the Youth and Young Adult Depression um, and Suicide Prevention Research Program with Dr. King. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight on this rainy evening. Uh, my name is Cindy Evil Foster. I'm also a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and also in Rackham Graduate School at U of M. I'm also a member of Cheryl's research team and um, continue to learn from her, which is much appreciated. Um, I also direct the University Center for the Child and Family here at the University of Michigan. I'm a clinical child psychologist. I also hope to share with you tonight uh, some of the training opportunities that Cheryl was mentioning. I'm a co-investigator on our state of Michigan's uh, youth suicide prevention grant that's funded by SAMHSA. And we also have a very similar grant here at the University of Michigan to support our campus. Um, and both between those two grants, we have some opportunities for training that um, you know, I hope to share with you all tonight. Hi, I'm Victor Hong. Um, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm the medical director of our psychiatric emergency services at the University of Michigan Hospital. And I'm also in charge of the uh, suicide assessment and risk management um, training program for our psychiatric trainees. Uh, does this one work? Yeah, it does. I'm Jonathan Stern. I'm the school social worker here at Pioneer High School. That's oh. it. <laughs> Thank you very much. So our first question is, why has the suicide rate increased so much in the last decade? OK. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't know for sure why. We know suicide risk is multifactorial. So it's not one thing that's changed. We actually also uh, are aware that the rate of depression in, among young people has gone up this century in the United States. So it seems like it's becoming more difficult to be a young person um, just with those two trends going together. Uh, You've probably seen some of what's been in the media the last week or two uh, related to social media and the suicide rate. Some of you may have seen articles. I think that there may be some influence there. Uh, it's probably not accounting for all of the increase. It's a very hard thing to study. But it is the case that there's a parallel climb in the use of social media. And there are studies to indicate that People who use it more sometimes are actually don't have a better mood um, because young people see everything that others post and how many people they've friended. And when you think about what youth post, it's often a party or when they're having a great time or, or look at all my friends. It isn't really capturing their, their full life. But if you were a more depressed or isolated youth at home, you might feel extremely left out. Uh, the other side of social media is that bullying takes on a very different form than when just the three people at recess, recess saw what happened. But here what we have is it's gone viral, and then it's been shared with even others. And uh, it can be a pain that doesn't go away because it stays up there. So I don't know if that's related to it. I think there's probably other reasons for the increase. And it's not dramatic. It's a gradual increase in depression and in risk for suicide. And there are probably other influences, but it is certainly possible 
that socio social media and some of the changes in our society with technology are playing into it in ways we don't fully understand. Another thing that is a little difficult to study, but certainly we can make the correlation, uh, certainly for older teens and in the early college, popu college age population, rates of drug and alcohol use have spiked dramatically over the past 20, 30 years, especially the use of prescription pills, opiate, pain medications, benzodiazepines. Um, and so you could certainly uh, make the correlation between uh, the rise in uh, drug use and, of course, uh, given that that's one of the main risk factors for suicide, the suicide rate increasing. Yeah, the, just a, the abuse of prescription medication is really a growing problem across the lifespan and very much is influencing our teens. So this question is uh, related. Um, it specifically asks about what research project projects are you aware of that evaluate school stress and suicidal ideation and or attempts um, that measure academic pressures to succeed and um, societal interactions and pressures. And I, I would like uh, the panelists, if they could, to talk about the research projects, but I would also be interested to hear from Jonathan about what you're seeing in the schools um, from the students themselves. Oh, you want me to start? Okay, uh, good. So I, I think that um, I'm glad this question was asked because I want to give a little sort of context to what happens in school and, and you know, what we see. Um, I think that, uh, I don't know anything about research projects, but I will say this, that uh, one of the things that's been important to me as the school district starts to look at comprehensive uh, mental health interventions and mental health um, sort of protective uh, processes is um, that we know students walk in with diagnosed mental illness, uh, undiagnosed mental illness. We know kids come in uh, with really difficult experiences at home and that tends to destabilize them. We've known this for years and, and we've been doing mental health interventions in schools for years. Uh, it's been kind of ad hoc, right? It's social workers, guidance counselors, teachers, and others that have been doing this. I think that what um, we've started a conversation at and that we need to uh, take a harder look at is what is um, sort of the impact of just school attendance, of trying to meet academic demands, um, of trying to sort of navigate a very complex social environment um, has on the kids uh, day to day. And what we need to um, look at is how we deliver curriculum, how we structure school days, and how we create um, what I would term emotionally healthy schools. Um, we're a, a bit of a distance from that. I mean, we have other efforts that are going on that are sort of micro level at this point, but um, I think that that conversation is, is starting and is, is gonna move forward for us. You know, it's interesting, um, someone was joking that we all wear a lot of hats at the University of Michigan. So one of the hats that I have worn for a number of years since joining the faculty is I supervise our psychoeducational testing service in several different places at U of M. And folks have said to me, Aren't, don't, how do those things go together? You do suicide prevention, you're doing testing too. And I really have always thought that they're very related because when we can identify early learning problems for young people and get them the supports that they need, they feel better about themselves, they feel more efficacious, they're more successful, and I think that puts kids on a better, more healthy trajectory as they're going through school. And, um, you know, a study that resonates with me, it's, you know, it's probably 10 years old, but I remember reading about a group of kindergarten and first graders who had undiagnosed attention and learning problems. And by the end of first grade, the kids who really were struggling in terms of meeting behavioral and learning expectations in the classroom were showing depressive symptoms. And I think any of us who have parented or been around children um, who struggle academically know how challenging and how stressful that is for young people. Um, so I do think that's something that's really important. Um, and you know, this wasn't in the, in the popular press, but there have been other changes that have happened nationally, you know, around the same time. And one is the downward extension in uh, curriculum expectations, right? We're asking more and more of kids younger and younger. And uh, kindergarten now looks like it did when we were in second grade. So I, you know, I wonder about some of these additional stressors for kids. I think the message is you know, more support and helping kids to feel successful in all the areas of their lives is important prevention. 
I was just going to add, in terms of my own research program development, I'm moving to more school-based collaborations around helping schools become, uh, nationally they think about it as trauma-sensitive schools or trauma-informed schools. Um, the Office for Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention recently put out um, an, a really comprehensive bulletin about this, as well as the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And so there are a number of groups around the nation that are collecting data right now. Um, I would say that a lot of the findings um, are, are not known, that these studies are going on currently, but really trying to, because we know from a clinical perspective that the need is so great and we just don't have the capacity. And so what we're trying to do is interface more and provide the screening in the schools, provide some professional development for teachers and staffs around what are some strategies they can do to be trauma-informed, um, as well as provide even some group-based interventions, some psychotherapy groups in the schools. So again, this doesn't get at every youth, but a number of youth are at elevated risk that have experienced a trauma and are currently struggling with traumatic stress, and that's having an impact on their attendance, their academic performance, their social emotional functioning, and so on. I just wanted to say one thing, piggyback on what Jonathan was saying, um, in that uh, school counselors and sort of training programs for um, school personnel in suicide prevention has been a really ad hoc, as you were saying. Um, you know, if you interview one school counselor, they'll say they do one thing, another one does a complete another thing. And I, I do want to call out and applaud um, Paul and Jazz from the Ann Arbor Public Schools. I, I actually think that um, they're doing a remarkable job of not sitting on their hands and really taking a proactive approach, a multi-pronged approach to making sure all of the school counselors have the same basic training, intervention skills, um, that they need to help uh, youth at suicide risk. The other thing I was just going to say, um, the last thing about the uh, prescription pill um, sort of epidemic that we're going through, is that when we're looking at ways to reduce um, suicide risk in our kids, uh, certainly from a means restriction point of view, you know, all of us as parents, uh, as parents really have to pay attention, special attention to securing all of our medications and our medication cabinets. We know that um, by suicide attempt, the medication overdose or drug overdose is by far the most common type of attempt of suicide. So if we can kind of reduce um, kids' uh, access to those means, uh, maybe we can make an impact. Can I, can I comment a little bit um, off of what Dr. Hong just said? Uh, um, I think it's important to know in terms of the efforts that AAPS is starting to do in terms of um, addressing mental health is that, you know, we've had lots of, you know, significant portions of people who have been trained in, in all sorts of things, critical incident stress management, assist training, safe talk, other kinds of things, that the effort now um, is not to have a few experts in each building or a few experts in the district, but to train large swaths of um, people in these sorts of skills um, that are, are, you know, directed at suicide prevention. Uh, and if I could give a, a, a little plug, although I don't have a big interest in it, the centerpiece of our um, mental health effort in um, Ann Arbor Public Schools is something called TRAILS. It used to be called CBT in the schools. Um, you should know when they changed the name, I did not vote for TRAILS. <laughs> um, but um, what that is, is they've uh, been here for a few years, have trained some staff in cognitive behavior therapy, staff are running groups. Um, and now we're talking about training large numbers of people in um, cognitive behavioral theory so that they have, um, you know, they can introduce elements of what they're doing, of what they're learning into everything that they do. So it becomes part of their curricular presentations. Uh, it certainly comes part of their intervening in students that they're worried about. Um. Thank you for that. Jonathan has been a great partner in that program, and um, that's led by Dr. Elizabeth Koshman, and the results from that have been really great in terms of increasing access to, to good care for students and, and um, has been really successful. So also when you're talking about um, training large groups of people, I have a lot of questions here about peers. Um, and the role that peers can play in suicide prevention. So another program that we do have in all of our school, all of our high schools, and we just started in middle schools, is our peer-to-peer -peer depression awareness program. 
Um, and so that we train groups of high schoolers and now middle schoolers to create awareness programs for their uh, fellow students so then they can be the ones that are the voice to hear our signs and symptoms, it's okay to seek help and hear the resources that are in your school. Um, so some of these questions also talk a bit about um, are they effective? And so we, we've done research on that as well that show that stigma is reduced, help seeking intentions are increased, um, and knowledge increases as well too. But um, I'm wondering if you guys have other ideas of good ways for teens to interact with each other when it comes to suicide prevention or problems in general. So, so I can talk a little, I don't mm -hmm. want to dominate here, but I, I can talk a little bit about some other things that are going on, um, not just peer to peer, but we also have um, here at Pioneer, uh, we have a group called Positive Peer Influence. It's a peer counseling group, and so we will bring in, we have a, a men's group and a women's group. We'll bring in any student that a concern has been expressed about or members have, um, are worried about, and we'll bring in um, them and, and help them to reflect on what's going on and, and make sure that they know that there are supportive students in the building for them. Um, Huron High School has a program they call Peer Facilitating. Um, they actually have a drop-in room that is staffed by students and um, other students can come in and talk about what's bothering them and what their stresses are and, and, and what they've been dealing with. Um, Skyline has Sky Squad, which does a whole host of, of um, peer-related support things. Um, they actually staff the counseling office, as I understand it, and so they may be the first people that someone who comes into the counseling office sees, uh, and they, they are getting instant peer support um, before they go ahead and, and visit with their counselor. So, um, we think continually about how peers can take a role in that. And, and that really speaks to the question that um, somebody had about the role that peers can play beyond identification of um, teen suicide risk. But then the follow-up question was, is that peer role too burdensome to minors? So I don't know if you guys could talk as researchers and also what you've seen in the school of how the students have responded and if it feels like too much of a burden for them. So I think that um, we've built a culture in the high schools uh, where um, much of, of what I learn about students in crisis comes from other students. So um, they're coming down and they're talking either because it's something that's very acute and they're really worried or it's um, I can't carry this kid anymore. I, I don't know what to do for them. And so yeah, it does sometimes become burdensome and um, so our you know, intervention is not just with the identified student but with the one that's trying to support them. So yes, it can be burdensome. I think that's such an important point because we know that most kids, if they're going to tell someone, they're going to tell a friend. So it, it, kids are involved in one another's suicide risk whether or not we have peer training programs. And so knowing that that happens, I think the peer training programs are giving these young people who are natural helpers, it's giving them resources. And um, I sure hope that some of these efforts will end up influencing the suicide rate in older adults as well, because we really are turning out a new generation of folks who are able to talk about mental health and able to talk about how to support one another. There are several uh, programs nationally that involve peers that show promising evidence, and if you're interested, you can learn more about them on the Suicide Prevention Resource Center website. Um, but reconnecting youth, sources of strength, these are some different um, programs that, that really are showing promise from a research standpoint that involve peers in suicide prevention in schools. Um, I will also add that uh, you know, one of the, the theories about suicide risk suggests that kids are at risk because they feel like they don't belong. And similarly, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is asking us to increase connectedness as a strategy to prevent suicide risk. And so I think these programs where we're in trying to change peer culture and empowering youth to support one another, that's why they're important. That's why they're working. You know, when we can create a school culture that is accepting of people's differences and their strengths and weaknesses and problems and build skills about how to support one another, that's what it's doing. It's creating connectedness and, and making everybody feel like they belong, even if they're not fitting inside one mold. I think it's important. I give you guys a lot of credit. And I actually uh, believe it's okay for our peers to feel some responsibility for each other. I think we all would agree with that. It's just managing how much, 
But the message to, um, to show you care, to listen, to be supportive, but then to encourage them to go to an adult. Uh, maybe it's not the first step isn't a mental health professional, but it's to tell an adult. But then just as importantly as that responsibility to be caring and listen and encourage that is the responsibility not to keep a secret. That's so important um, that we uh, talk with our children about that and that our students are aware. At the end of the day, if you encourage them to get help and they don't, and they don't tell an adult, we still don't want to keep a secret. We want what's happening that you're saying. They go to you and they tell you so that they've tried with the peer, but they don't leave it there. If needed, they go directly uh, to an adult. So is it possible that in our efforts to reduce stigma and all this work that we're doing um, and talk more about suicide that we're normalizing it too much? Kids see it as an option because they become so familiar with it. How do we send a message that it is not an option? Well, one of the things that we know is that it actually is a common myth that if we ask a young person about suicide that we're implanting the idea. And so I would say that it's still important to really try to understand the young person's pain and their sense of hopelessness and whether or not they're considering suicide or planning suicide. And that those processes are going on irrespective if we ask or not. And that is strongly you know, backed up by a lot of data. And I can also just say from my own clinical experience, so I can definitely understand you know, why people may think that, because we certainly don't want to encourage young people to engage in negative behaviors and outcomes, but um, we know that that actually is a myth. I will, I will just add, though, I completely uh, agree with everything that Polly said. We do know, though, that the way that um, death by suicide is covered in the media, for example, is important and can influence vulnerable youth. And so again, I'll refer you back to the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. There is a wonderful guide about safe and effective messaging related to suicide. And um, you know, I think this is something that we're trying to learn about, um, but you know, contagion is a, a real phenomenon and I think it's important to, you know, to think about that um, and I would you know, encourage any of you who are in the media or who are um, thinking about awareness campaigns to, to, um, to read that resource. I'll just say one more thing about that. Um, certainly this year there was a lot of uh, talk in the media about um, the TV show 13 Reasons Why, or the Netflix show 13 Reasons Why. And one of the criticisms of that show is that they didn't follow these um, sort of standard media guidelines in that they portrayed um, the suicide or the person who died by suicide as unable to uh, access help from adults, school counselors. The adults in the show were portrayed um, as somewhat uh, kind of clueless and unable to help. And so one of the main messages is that if you do bring up the issue of suicide is not that you just leave it at that, but that you back it up with uh, all sorts of recommendations of who you can go to for help and, and effective help rather than kind of just bringing it up and leaving it. You know, uh, stigma is a little bit tricky because I think what we really want to do is destigmatize mental illness, mental health, problems and getting help for them. That's really what we want to destigmatize. When there's a suicide, we can understand it. Someone likely struggled with mental illness and had overwhelming pain and life difficulties, concerns. But really what we're destigmatizing is getting help for mental illness and trying to make it more akin to getting help for any other kind of medical problem or illness. That said, we are already seeing a generational shift. Some of our work is with universities across the nation. They actually, the main barrier that they're reporting to getting help is no longer stigma. So we, I think this is actually a great accomplishment. 
It still exists, not as strong as it once was. The main barrier they're reporting is actually giving it a big enough priority to take time to do it. It doesn't seem like a big enough priority. They're pressured with their schoolwork. I don't want to take the time out to deal with it. So that tells us something um, for our peers and for ourselves as parents to uh, make sure people know that their own well-being and quality of life is a priority. It doesn't really come in second. It's kind of like on an airplane where you put your face mask on first before you help others. We really need young people to know we, we want you to take care of your health first and then attend to these other things. So I have a question here about uh, the percentages of secondary suicides in the family after a completed suicide. Um, so if somebody loses a family member to suicide, how likely is another member of the family to complete suicide? It's a, it is a slight increased risk. Um, we don't think of it as a primary risk factor. You know, there are reasons for the slight increased risk. One of them might be genetic, biological vulnerability to the same illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression. Another might be role modeling, a, a form of coping or difficulties that were in the home, shared stress that had to do with substance abuse or domestic violence. Um, so there is some increased risk, but it is, it is not uh, major. I, I will add that um, in the scheme of thinking about suicide prevention, if you think about it as a continuum, sort of, oh, sorry. I just said, I would add that in the scheme of suicide prevention, if you think about it as a continuum where the beginning is universal prevention and skill building, but the end is postvention and the way that we support people who have lost someone to suicide. And that is an important piece of prevention. And um, there are survivors of suicide groups that are here at the University of Michigan. There's one that runs at the Mary Rackham Institute. Um, so I, I encourage folks to disseminate those resources. I think when folks have suffered a loss by suicide, um, the stigma does sometimes prevent people from seeking support and from, it prevents others from knowing how to support. And, um, and so I think those resources can be very helpful. So I have several questions here about parents. Um, and the first one is, how can we tell the difference between depression and dangerous thoughts and adolescent development or hormonal changes? As an aunt to five nieces, I can tell you that's a challenge indeed. I just want to validate that. It is very challenging. But I also think that, you know, as a caregiver or you know someone that loves a child the most important thing that we can all do is really trust our gut and you know how sometimes we have a conversation with our child or the young person in our lives or we maybe can't sleep at night because we're wrestling with something they might have said or the way they're behaving or maybe something feels a little bit different with the current struggles I would encourage you not to ignore that and to really trust that and you know, while we recognize that there are limitations to kind of clinics and other resources, it still doesn't mean it's not something that's available to you. And so it is important to take that next step if you're trying to um, kind of differentiate those things. Even the pediatrician is a resource. You know, taking your child in to have an appointment and to talk with a healthcare provider and to kind of see if they're kind of having the same impression that you are and what their recommendations might be. So my main message here is just to really trust your instincts. And sometimes we can't quite put our finger on why, we're, why we are concerned, but we just know that we are, and it's important to trust that. Uh, and on a sort of a different bent in this, I think that one of the um, barriers that we face in terms of um, making sure that kids are gonna be safe and get the uh, interventions they need um, has a lot to do with their perception of their parents' reaction to this. Uh, so there, there are kids who will say, you know, they have so much to worry about. I've got three little brothers, and they have the 
they just they're just not going to pay attention to what I do, or they don't believe in depression, or um, you know, it's it's just not something I think that will be acceptable at home. Uh, and it's also you know sometimes it is that um, perception of parents of their kids, you know, like depression is a normative adolescent state. So what are we so concerned about? Um, so I think yeah, you know your words are are well taken. It's, you know, it's about remaining open and um, just sort of starting a process. Even if you, you know, have no idea what to do, just call somebody you think that might, um, whether it's a school person or your family physician or someone like that. So that leads very well into the question of how do teens address parents that are causing a stressful environment at home or parents that won't listen when teens try to talk about their feelings? One is that it's, it's not always the, the parent. Um, we, we would like it to be the parent, but what we want to encourage the young people, and we hope parents will encourage your children and students, is to find someone that you can talk with and share it with. You know, maybe it is an aunt or a grandparent or a friend's parent. It, it may well be the parent, but there might be a day when the parents in that house, they can't, they really will not listen. They're overwhelmed, they can't manage anything more. Uh, and we want the teens to know from us that it's okay to talk to other adults too. It doesn't have to be that everything comes to the parent. In terms of what to say to the parent, I think the key is timing, just like when we talk with our kids. You know, at a time when emotionality is very low, that there's a calmness um, is really a time to talk about more difficult things. And so helping them with timing, but also I think to have realistic expectations. Uh, it may go well and it may not. Sometimes in a therapy session, we might be role playing with the teen. How might you say this to your parent? I'll play your parent. You know, what if they say this? because they, we can't have them expect that they're going to pour this out and they're going to get the kind of response that would be ideal because the parents are humans too and parents also have their own struggles and difficult days. One other thing I'll say is, you know, when we see kids coming into the emergency room uh, at risk for suicide, you know, the majority of them or at least a good number of them are, are actually in therapy. They're seeing a therapist regularly they have for many months on an individual basis. And uh, it's surprising to me often how many times the family is not involved in the therapy. Yes, the kid has to get their own therapy, but uh, you know, certainly we're a big proponent of family therapy. And those family interventions where you get the kid and the parents in the same room with a therapist together uh, can be quite powerful. Uh, in helping the teen or the kid uh, learn ways to manage their parents and the parents manage their kids together. So that actually, I, I think, just answered the, the question that I had about if they're seeking therapy, is it enough to have the child there or does the entire family needs to be there? And I think um, Victor just talked to, it's really beneficial to have the family there. I don't know if anyone has anything else to add about that. So if you can get the family there, get the family there. But so we were talking about parents who might not be as involved or supportive, but on the flip side, as a parent, how do we walk out of this lecture having a depressed teen and not worry all of the time? Wait, not worry about them all the time? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> um, I think the worry is, is part of it. Um, I, I think that, uh, I think one of the things that I would, I would guide parents on is um, to not be so terribly afraid about making a mistake, about saying the wrong thing. Um, the wrong thing to do is to try to push it aside. Um, as, as long as you're open, as long as you're talking, and as long as you're willing to, um, you know, the, the question you asked is, what am I willing to do for my kid? And I think most of us would say, you know, anything. So, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the clinicians at the table would say, but, um, for me, it's the, the only wrong act is to not act. Um, so just, you know, stay on it. How do you stop worrying? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they can tell me. I wasn't going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs>
But I was just going to, but someone else might, but I was just going to build off of what you were saying um, and just encourage you to start small. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, even with teens, it's, it's important to have kind of what we call emotion check-ins. And you can, you can use it in a, a language that they can understand, right? Because, you know, no one likes psychobabble. I, I, I don't like it either. But I mean things like trying to get a sense of like, what was their highlight for today? What was their low light for today? And so in other words, just starting small, it may be really challenging. Like I think the previous question was kind of maybe getting at maybe there's some repair opportunities that need to happen. Maybe there have been reactions that you regret. I mean, as Dr. King said, we're human. But I think trying to create a, a new culture, kind of like what we're trying to do in the schools. And you can do it with all of your kids. You know, if you take all your kids to school, that's a great time to do it. Turn the radio off and, and you engage in it too, obviously, you know, in a developmentally appropriate way. But have everyone go around and tell what their highlight is for the day and what their low light was or, or what they're looking forward to or what they're worried about. Like, there's some simple strategies like that that kind of model for your child that you're a vessel, that you're available, so that when they do need to come to you with some of the bigger things or the heavier things, you've kind of laid a groundwork and they may feel more comfortable coming. I do think worrying is just part of being a parent. Uh, but I think one thing that helps a great deal is to not worry alone. And I think this goes with something that you mentioned, Polly and Victor, um, to have our own support group, to share it with another a partner, another adult, and with a professional. So that what we've really done is we've created a team, almost like we've locked arms around a youth, and we have at least a systematic understanding or strategy. This is what we're watching out for. This is each of our roles. We'll support each other. It is a lo much less lonely place to be uh, with a teen than to be a parent alone uh, with a teen who's struggling. I'll just say one more related thing. So, you know, we've seen a huge spike uh, in kids coming to the ER with suicidal thoughts. And I, I see it as sort of a two-sided thing. I, on one hand, we, <laughs> We struggle ourselves to keep up with the demand, and we try our best to um, have other resources that parents and teens can access so they don't have to come to the ER. But on the other hand, you know, when we stop and sit back and think about it a little bit, a teen or their parent has come in because they actually are doing the right thing and, and are seeking help and are making sure that the teen is okay. You know, when we sit back, I sort of think we should be applauding them and praising them, like, you did the right thing to come in today. Yes, we're busy, and yes, we would prefer that 20 people didn't come at the same time. But at the same, but that being said, you know, we have to praise the parents uh, in seeking help for their teen and the teen for opening up. So there's a question here about um, age. So uh, they know of an 11-year-old who has had two classmates confide in, the, confide in them that they're thinking of suicide. So. If you could speak a little bit to, are we seeing younger and younger kids having thoughts of suicide and why that might be? Is there research on that, Cheryl? I, I don't know, but from an anecdotal perspective and clinical perspective, there is absolutely no doubt. Uh, I don't know the numbers, though. Yeah, there is, there is some increase younger. There still is not a lot of it prior to ages 11 and 12. But we have seen some increase in uh, late elementary age children. So there's the also message, a question. Oh, go ahead. No. I think the message would be to never discount that disclosure because a child is young. You always want to take it seriously. So there was also a question here about sort of the future and the uncertainty of the future nowadays and sort of the culture that we're living in, um, just wondering how, if at all, that contributes to suicide risk. Big questions. <laughs> I think it just connects to, I keep going back to childhood because I think we, 
we do a lot of these practices with our younger kids and you know as our kids grow up and in their teens it can be harder to do but just think about when a child was like five or six and they worried about the boogeyman and you know maybe you got out some spray or you did whatever you could to provide that kind of security for them and that reassurance that as the adult you would handle adult things and I think that's still important even for teens even though they come across really mature and um, maybe they're taller than you even but they're still they're still children and they need that reassurance from you and I think you know there's lots of things that we don't have control over but certainly we have control over what goes on in our homes and so I would just encourage you and just try to empower you to to not lose sight of the things that you do have control over and and to do those things as much as possible in terms of affirming your child and validating your child and listening to your child and just giving them that assurance that you know you're still taking care of the adult things so the question here is why do adolescents turn to ways of uh, like cutting when struggling with situations so why self-harm so I think this is a puzzling um, presentation. You know, I think those of us clinically um, have seen this for a long time, and, and it's always, um, you know, it, you, it, it gives you pause to see a young person injuring themselves in that way, and it can be frightening for parents and unsettling for clinicians. I think kids tell us a couple of different things about why they cut. Um, one is that, you know, I think often um, when kids are struggling with a lot of pain, one of the ways that they cope with that is to sort of numb out, you know, to, to shut down and stop feeling. And so the act of cutting, they communicate that that actually um, sort of reassures them that they're still alive and that they're feeling pain and that, and that um, it connects them in some way to their aliveness. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that, that kids um, talk about. The other thing that we hear from young people is that when they are in this sort of overwhelming um, psychic pain, kind of existential pain, that it's almost helpful to um, transfer that to physical pain, and then they can see it. And it is this idea that, um, you know, when, our, when we have a young person who has a, a life-threatening medical condition, most of us are aware, you know, they, they've been through treatment, they've been in the hospital, people are bringing casseroles to the house. Um, and when kids are in that level of psychic distress, often folks aren't quite as aware. And, and so they're sitting with it sometimes alone. Um, and so I, I think the cutting um, is a, just a way that they're managing that. Um, Non-suicidal self-injury is an important warning sign that we should all be taking seriously. And um, I think it's, it, it is concerning for me because it tells me that kids are getting used to the idea of hurting themselves and that's not a good thing. It tells me that their coping resources are not adequate for what it is that they're trying to manage. And so we wanna give them a different set of tools and some different, a different repertoire for managing what's going on. I would never want to downplay the, the presence of non-suicidal self-injury cutting behaviors. Um, however, you know, I think that um, hopefully some research will be done uh, around the issue of the contagion effect of that behavior. We know that there is, uh, can be a contagion effect around suicide attempts. And so um, again, clinically or anecdotally, we see that there are clusters of kids who if one person is doing it, the whole group does it. I'm interested to see what research develops out of that. So if teens can manage through the teen years and college years, how likely are they able to navigate adulthood with less mental health challenges? Well, I, I think it is, um, really important to do all we can to see them through these years. And I do think it often gets better. And what I mean by that is adolescents um, 
exposure and availability of alcohol, drugs, um, prescription meds uh, around them on the street, probably in the school. Um, it is the age when we have the onset of depressive disorder usually during the adolescent, early adulthood years. So we've got depression. We have all of the social complexities that were mentioned trying to navigate. We have uh, all the hormonal and physical changes. We have the availability of drugs. We have leaving home to new environments and managing on your own with all of the opportunities suddenly available to you. And I often thought when I was working in the clinic with teens, my goal is to get them through six months, the next year, the next year, with the idea you get them past this highest risk period for some of these problems, and it does get better. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a worsening of some psychiatric conditions or an exacerbation or remission, but there are special challenges in adolescence and early adulthood. Uh, key developmental period for getting launched as an independent adult who can survive and manage their emotions as well as their life. And it does, that part does change. I would just add that it also speaks to the importance of just intervention and trying to build up their toolkit and making sure that they have the strategies so that hopefully they will have learned something in a positive way in terms of coping or they've practiced some positive life skills so that when they do en encounter you know, difficulties once they're beyond emerging adulthood, that they can remember that experience. They might have to go in you know, for a booster or to see someone else or maybe they on their own can figure out how to adapt those strategies to better fit their life as a middle-aged adult but I think it really speaks to the importance of not ignoring our concerns and taking action and having great programs at the school and this idea of a team and having so many people wrap our arms around them um, because, you know, we all know it, we, we still go through stress and, and life situations and transitions even throughout adulthood. Um, one other thing that I think it's important to also recognize is that this transition age from adolescence to adulthood is taking much longer than it used to. So a study came out last year, so for the first time in the modern age, there were more, uh, more people under the age of 35 that were living with um, a parent than without. And so, you know, whereas it used to take uh, kids a few years to transition from adolescence to adulthood. Now we kind of think of it as it, take, it could take 5, 10, 15 years. There's a variety of reasons why that might be. But I think we have to be aware just these days it does seem to take kids a, a lot longer to reach that adult phase and we, they need a lot more support to get through that phase. I think one thing that I wanted to say after listening to Dr. Gibson was I think that one of the sort of um, I want to say subtweet, but I know that doesn't work in this audience. Um, <laughs> sort of subtext in the in the efforts that we make is that um, we want to bring some uh, benefit to the help-seeking behavior. Um, so developing, I think, good help-seeking behavior by by making sure that we are responding appropriately to the needs that are coming to us. I'm guessing would have some um, sort of impact in, in how adults um, will be help-seeking in the future. So I think we have time um, for just about one more question, um, and this is about resources. So apart from youth and family services, what resources are there in the community for youth from low-income families who may be struggling with mental illness, substance use disorders, and suicidality? So I'm, I mean, I can uh, speak to one is um, community mental health does um, a really good job, has um, highly skilled therapists and, and um, you know, psychiatrists working um, with them, and, and they are a really important resource for us in schools. Any other suggestions? I will point out that we have our resource table out there that has several resources, um, including a low-income resource booklet, so check that out on your way out. 
Um, I think we got to most of the questions. I apologize if we did not get to yours, but I think our panelists will stick around for a minute or two um, if you have additional questions. But um, please help me thank our panelists um, for their time today and their expertise. We really appreciate it. Thank you.